Welcome everyone, this is uh, Dr. Jaitley, your cardiologist uh, from New York on your favorite uh, video site, uh, Muni Meter Health, which is being shown on several uh, uh, social uh, platforms, media. Thank you for being on Muni Meter Health, your uh, teaching uh, and educational uh, site. We are showing uh, short video vignettes, uh, primarily covering the human heart, the cardiology, both in health and illness. The whole idea is wanting to prevent uh, the disease from uh, onset. And of course, once the disease has occurred, then obviously we want to see if uh, the progression can be checked and therefore the complications can be prevented. Nothing like improving their patient education. So that's one of the goals here. We want to improve the medical education to our medical fraternity, including the students, residents, and fellows. And of course, my <laughs> colleagues old like me. And then of course, uh, patients at large and general masses who are now attending various clinics, hospitals, offices, etc. And uh, they've been diagnosed with conditions, etc. They've been asked to uh, prevent uh, certain um, conditions by getting their testings done, etc. So the whole idea is wanting to improve the clinical outcomes, which has been my deepest belief. And without any further ado, I'd like to delve into the subject matter, which I always do in a short way, and that is, what is a stroke? Well, we have discussed uh, so much of cardiovascular because this is also part of a vascular system, which is a very, very important vascular system in the brain, obviously, as you know. And uh, the whole idea is wanting to see if we can actually uh, quickly draw, uh, maybe perhaps uh, what it looks like is the head here, for instance. And um, if you look at, uh, uh, obviously, this is your neck here. So when you look at examine the head, uh, basically, it is cerebral uh, hemispheres here, if you will. And I'll draw the cerebral, cerebral hemispheres quickly like this. And essentially, it's a, it's a several gyri and several sulci, if you will, that increases the surface area of the brain, as you know. Anything that increases or improves the brain surface area will actually improve the number of cells. So the, uh, some, sometimes it's given that you know, you're born with those uh, zillion cells in your brain and that determines your uh, intellect, that determines your mind, your ability to think, etc., and, and carry on with your lives. And that is so very true. But the beauty about the brain is also that it does not uh, you know, take uh, too much of an insult, if you will. The, like the myocardial, like we talk about the heart, for instance, if you're looking at the heart, normally the heart would uh, sustain uh, uh, some bit of ischemia, lack of blood supply, like oxygen, if it drops, um, up to 24 hours, you can still be able to recover. That's the maximum, by the way. I mean, ideally, you should want to do it within four hours of, your, of the insult that occurs. And that's when they offer the thrombolytic or the, or the, you know, the clot buster therapy intravenously, if you will, in general terms. S but that's not true with the brain. The brain cannot take the insult for beyond four hours. So within four hours, somebody has to really get that person into the hospital to offer that intravenous clot buster called thrombolytic therapy. So that is the importance of this video vignette to really emphasize that, look, if somebody's having a stroke, somebody's starting to even experience a bit of it immediately get to the hospital or if you have signs and symptoms of any of that kind. So get to the hospital right away. Or call, call 911 if you're in the United States via an ambulance, get to the hospital or, or, or dial a number in your, in your city, in your country, wherever you are. Now, there are three types of uh, strokes, thrombotic, embolic, and hemorrhagic. Now, hemorrhage obviously, obviously uh, could be either from hypertension, because that is the biggest, biggest risk factor. As we know, as I've pointed out, the, all cardiovascular risk factors, by the way, they are prone for atherosclerosis. So wherever there is atherosclerosis, obviously those vessels are getting more and more narrower, and the plaques are starting to interfere with the circulation as a result, and these are the plaques that I'm drawing here, for instance. And I'm sure you've seen these in, uh, schematics earlier on my previous videos. If not, then maybe perhaps now. And as you see, the flow gets compromised the longer, the bigger the plaques they grow. So those become ischemic strokes and the ischemic strokes normally imply either they're thrombotic or they're embolic. Hemorrhagic strokes normally occurs in a hypertensive setting where there's a small little aneurysm for instance within the brain that was there and that got ruptured or what have you. So hypertension and normally that occurs during very severe exertion sometimes during intercourse or sex so that has been you know that has been the norm with subarachnoid hemorrhage we call it 
or intracranial hemorrhage. So these are the two hemorrhages that can occur. And sometimes subacronoid hemorrhage could be very difficult to uh, diagnose and you may need a lumbar puncture test here and we'll talk about that in a second. So hypertension is a risk factor. Diabetes, obviously, uh, it potentiates atherosclerosis. These are all the factors which are potentiating. Smoking is a big, big factor. And in fact, it starts in the carotid arteries, if you will. There are carotids that are running across uh, from the neck vessels, as you know, from the great vessels, from the aorta. And these uh, divide into two exact, exactly like that and uh, forming the carotid artery and the, the internal carotid artery and the vertebral artery that goes behind. So you have these uh, in the neck and obviously they are arising from the arch of the aorta. So these vessels can have the same process, same process of atherosclerosis. It's a long name, but just remember it's called in other words, simple, simply, if I have to call it, I'll just call it aging. <laughs> but atherosclerosis is the big uh, aging process that occurs within the endothelium of these uh, vessels where there are foamy cells to begin with and later on becoming fatty streaks and later on fatty plaques, if you will. And that has been a very, very important area which is currently going under clinical and a uh, um, lot of research where they are trying to see if they can uh, you know, delay the atheros atherosclerosis, delay the aging process. And, uh, anyway, so smoking is a big factor. Diabetes, as I said, high lipids, obviously, if your HDL is low and which is healthy cholesterol and LDL is very, very high. So remember that lipids, LDL, lousy or lazy cholesterol is very, very high or HDL, which is very, very low. That is the healthy cholesterol. And then, of course, if you have a family history now, now in African population, African-American population, as well as in Asians, there is an increased proneness for hemorrhage. Remember that. So intracranial hemorrhage and subacronoid hemorrhage, there is a higher incidence than the whites, than the Caucasians. So this is just, uh, so obviously age is important. Sex is important. Gender is important. And then you have your race race uh, features I just defined. So anything less than 45, you start st suspecting embolic uh, strokes. Why? Because then most likely it is not an atherosclerotic process because that has not occurred yet. Uh, atherosclerosis is still to manifest after the age of 45. So pa past the age of 45, start to think on these lines, but 45 and under start to think on embolic strokes. So this is less than 45. So you look for cardiac sources like atrial fibrillation, like an arrhythmia, where clots can form, acute myocardial infarction, which is a massive heart attack, and valvular disease, because you may have endocarditis or even vegetations from long time, and they could, uh, they could uh, fly off, and next thing is in the systemic circulation, and the first stop is obviously in the brain. So that's pretty scary. Infective endocarditis, as I said, where there could be subacute bacterial endocarditis, where the vegetations can get infected, and then next thing is uh, they can, again, get dislodged from the uh, from the valves, mitral valve and the aortic valve, which are on the left side. Heart failure, specifically, speci especially so if the left ventricle is markedly weak. If your left ventricle is markedly weak and therefore it's not able to contract, so there tends to be more stagnation of blood and therefore it is more thrombogenic, if you will. Or And it's called, it's seen on an echo as LV smoke. So LV smoke is a sign on echo and that'll be on the boards, folks. So just remember that. That'll be a question. They might show you actually a clip. I can't show you a clip here, but just so that you know, if you were to do a 2D echo, uh, you might see in a long axis view or on a four chamber apical view where the blood can actually start to stagnate and appears like a smoke swirling around within the LV. So that is a very, very uh, precarious sign for future embolism, future thrombi, etc., etc., from the booster chamber called the left ventricle. So it's pretty scary. Now, there might be hypercoagulable states. Now, cardiolipin uh, antibodies, lupus, for instance, in, um, in somebody who has SLE. And then, uh, then there are other uh, rarer um, uh, blood tests you can actually order, and these blood tests could be check, uh, checking antiphospholipid antibodies for checking for protein C resistance. They could be checking for factor V leading antibodies, and of course the lupus anticoagulant. So all of these could be seen, and especially you'll suspect this in very young people because when there's no rhyme or reason like atherosclerosis, when there's no rhyme or reason for any cardioembolic phenomenon and a young person suffers a stroke, especially if there are multiple strokes that are happening. Um, I've seen protein C, protein S, and all these uh, deficiencies or resistances can actually lead to um, uh, strokes specifically in the younger individuals. They have huge venothrombotic uh, 
or a tendency to form clots within the legs or pulmonary emboli, emboli or even the stroke, uh, as I said, the brain, uh, brain attacks, we call them in other words. Now, having defined that, what are the tests that you can do? Well, blood tests will obviously be indicated in these settings. And of course, you must do uh, lipids. You must know what the HDL is. You must know what the LDL is. And of course, know what the triglycerides are. And therefore, you know the whole total cholesterol as well. Platelets must be known because if your platelets are very, very uh, less than 150,000, you're in trouble because then you tend to bleed. But if they are more than uh, more than uh, more than a million, then you're more thrombotic, obviously. So you could be thrombotic or you could be hemorrhagic as a result of your platelet count. So this is very very important, and this could be prevalent in many cancer patients. So you should look for history of cancer. Obviously, look for history of leukemia, and we can go on and so forth. Lymphomas, sometimes certain drugs, medications can drop the platelets. So be very very leery of those of those facts. Anticoagulants, obviously, the patients who have already being on uh, say Coumadin for instance and uh, so you, it's, it's a very very high risk obviously so you have to check for the INR maybe the person may develop a stroke as a result of over anticoagulation or anti under anticoagulation so it could be either hemorrhagic or it could be thrombotic depending upon where the INR is so so you have to be very very careful to look at all those things. Uh, CT scan is obviously uh, is a given uh, that CT of the head will really define the location of the test the uh, location of the uh, the infarct the brain infarct it'll tell us how many infarcts have occurred rather because lacunar infarcts could be multiple of those so it'll tell us that it'll also give us the location and the size the magnitude of the magnitude of the territory involved which artery was involved or which um, uh, which vessel was involved so it's very very important sometimes subarachnoid hemorrhage is not seen and it could be obscured just by a severe headache and some neurological deficit and when you do a ct scan it does not show up so lumbar puncture is the answer there so so you might want to do a lumbar puncture and that will show um, um, uh, um, uh, 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 hemorrhagic uh, CSF. MRIs can be done and MRIs will be very, very helpful in locating uh, the, again, the scan. Uh, uh, through the scan will be able to tell us where the stroke is. Carotid duplex, echo and uh, transesophageal are routine specifically so if you're suspecting in uh, whether it's atherosclerotic uh, strokes or whether it is cardioembolic strokes so either way you'll end up doing uh, uh, carotid duplex echo and t specifically it'll, it'll be very useful in prognosticating whether whether or not you still have enough uh, disease uh, burden especially like t for instance will be able to tell us about the aortic uh, atheromas and normally uh, these are missed uh, because hey, if the echo is normal or crowded duplex are normal then T will give you an answer that the arch of the aorta showed uh, uh, atheromas and that could be the that could be the cause of all these thrombotic strokes and as we just talked about. Uh, treatment plan is really, uh, as I said, you have to get the patient into the into the emergency room and into the hospital rather quick. And within four hours, you can start an intravenous. Now, this is intravenously given, and that's an RTPA, which is uh, which is uh, recombinant uh, tissue plasminogen activator (TPA). It's been around for like 15, 20 years now. Altipase is the example, and you must use this within four hours only, because after that, the you know the yield is extremely, extremely little, especially when you're talking about the brain here because the brain really doesn't uh, recover after after as I said a four-hour insult so you have to really get to get the person and even four hours is too much so like within an hour in fact most programs in the United States they bring the patient within the emergency room and therefore the neurologist is the protocol is initiated and uh, they get the they get the IV thrombolytic uh, therapy going in the ER itself after the after the CAT scan now intraarterial thrombectomy is another way where you can actually offer a stent provided it's the proximal large artery that's involved if it's a proximal large artery involved then you can actually go ahead and put a stent here and the stent will be placed somewhere here for instance or somewhere here it could be done in extra cranial this is EC and it could be done intracranial which is IC so depending upon and it'll be it'll be all done by the carotid arteries and uh, so this is again it's a very very uh, I would call it a you know obviously a precarious procedure but the fact is that it is still um, you know very very helpful in the earlier stages if the person can get it. Anticoagulants are really reserved only for embolic strokes uh, provided we have ruled out the hemorrhage part because some of the embolic strokes later on become hemorrhagic so once uh, there is no hemorrhage seen on any CT scans or MRIs and uh, no hemorrhage in other words then you can go ahead and 
So this has to be negative. So if once it's negative on CT or MRI, the hemorrhage, and there's no bleeding tendency, you can go ahead and anticoagulate these patients because you want to prevent any further cardioembolic uh, uh, phenomenon, especially so if they are heart failure patients, atrial fibrillations, et cetera, et cetera, because they have a tendency for embolism. And that could be done as long-term as well. So for long-term, patients can be on anticoagulation provided their INRs could be monitored. Okay, so in a nutshell, you learned about the three kinds of strokes, uh, thrombotic, embolic, and hemorrhagic, and of course, uh, numerous cardiovascular risk factors, including hypercoagulable states and cardioembolism, which are the major, major um, causes uh, for uh, strokes. I've tried to enumerate in this quick video. Certain, certain blood tests are very helpful. Uh, CAT scans, MRIs, and carotid duplexes is the way to go. And of course, get an echo NT if necessary to uh, supplement your, your diagnostic information and thrombolytic therapy within intravenous uh, by intravenous route within four hours is extremely extremely rewarding and intraarterial thrombectomy can also be done in an earlier stage if it's a larger artery involved but if it is a small penetrating artery like here someplace then obviously intravenous uh, uh, thrombolytic therapy is the answer okay so hope you enjoyed the session here again and looking forward to come back again and uh, discuss more on my next video so stay well stay healthy stay heart healthy eat, eat start uh, uh, starting to eat or uh, heart uh, healthy as well and again stay on money meter health your favorite video site until then say say goodbye